reception room was elegant and refined. Portrait ferns, restrained landscapes, and a hush that said there was no need for ostentation. A slender young man with glasses, thinning hair, and a truly impressive moustache looked up from his desk. A different secretary than when Evan had visited the place with Marcus nearly a month ago. Do you have an appointment? His eyes drifted over Evan's travel-stained cloak. Green uniform and no longer well-shined boots, he went back to his papers, as if not caring about the answer to his question. Evan's mouth tightened. His uniform wasn't proper gentleman's attire, he knew, but it was comfortable and familiar. If clothes truly did make the man, then why wasn't he afforded respect based upon his military service? If he dressed like an idle dilettante, people would jump to do his bidding. The Earl of Whitelock to see his solicitors. He put one of his cards on the desk, snapping the corner as he did so. The young man's neck jerked straight, and he almost leapt from his chair. Lord Whitelock? Of course, he gulped. Please take a seat. Would you like a cup of tea? I'll just nip into the office and see which of the gentlemen is available to meet with you. He scuttled from the room like his coattails were smouldering, and without waiting for an answer about the tea. Evan yanked off his gloves, tucked them in his cloak pockets, and removed the heavy garments. With so many capes on the shoulders, it was certainly warm. But this style made him think of wearing his military park. It was so weighty. He took a seat and picked up a newspaper neatly laid out on a small table. His name leapt off the crisp pages. White lock nuptial celebration graced with royal visit. All the details of the ceremony and reception were there, including the Prince Regent's arrival and announcement of Diana's inheritance. The newspaper expressed surprise that the couple had reportedly left the city so quickly especially with such a fortune now at their disposal. The Earl and Countess of Whitelock will surely be the most sought-after guests at upcoming social events this season, and it is hoped they will return from their wedding trip quickly, though with the rumoured royal visit this spring, perhaps they would stay in the country preparing for the big event. The article finished by commenting that Lady Whitelock, because of her great beauty, her father's title, and the inheritance, would have been named the incomparable of this season. And wasn't it quick work by the new earl to snap her up before others could ply their suits? Evan felt like a fortune hunter. He'd barely had time to toss the paper onto the table in disgust when the secretary returns. My lord, won't you please come with me? You may leave your cloak here. The man practically genuflected clasping his hands together and hunching his shoulders in an effort to please. The inner office was even more richly appointed than the reception room, with walnut panelling, thick woolen carpeting, and golden drapes at the windows. Leather-bound homes ranked on shelves, looking as if they had never been opened, and green-shaded lamps stood on the corners of a massive desk. A pleasure to see you again, my lord. Mr. Moody, a lawyer Evan and Marcus had met with the day after Evan's first audience with the Prince Regent, stretched out his hands, his chin jutting, and his eyes gleaming behind his square frame glasses. Please, won't you sit down and tell me how I may be of assistance to you? Anthony, bring tea. Unless you'd prefer something stronger? He raised bushy eyebrows toward Evan. At ten in the morning? No, thank you. He took the chair off it, the leather butter soft under his hands. The lawyer took his seat, rested his forearms on his desk, and laced his fingers. What can I do for you? Evan tamped down his true feelings and kept his voice businesslike. It's about the matter of my wife's inheritance. I understand the Home Secretary was going to see to the transfer of ownership from a trust to me. Oh yes, and so he has done. I have the paperwork here. He slid open a drawer and withdrew a folder. The money is in the account we opened for you at the Bank of London when we transfer the remaining of the Whitelock funds into it. Flipping open the file, he scanned a ledger page. 
I have taken care of certain bills that arrived here before your marriage. A teller, a haberdasher, a bootmaker. I had thought there would be more expenses, but you've been most frugal up to now. His finger followed a line of neat entries, and then his eyes rose to Prue's Evans uniform. Should I expect more debits on the accounts? More tellering, perhaps? Evan nodded. There will be many new drawers on the account, and I'm sure tailoring will be somewhere amongst the invoices. He would need some sturdy working clothes and some riding attire. Perhaps he could order them, have them sent to Whitehaven, and get by with his uniforms until they arrived. Of course, with such an impressive sum and coming from... He hesitated, then must have decided to be quite frank and plunged on. Such pedestrian origins. You must want to really splash on some things. Horses, club memberships, carriages. Once you have entrance to white saboodles, your marker will be good at the tables. So may I assume there will be wagering debts? And if you have a mistress to set up in a house of her own, I assure you, I handle such matters for my clients. With the utmost discretion. You'll want to experience some of the finer things in life now that you have the means. I am a bit of a wine connoisseur myself, and would be happy to help you lay down a nice cellar. Was the man aware that he was rubbing his thumb across his fingertips, as if he could feel the money in his hands? The solicitor spoke of buying horses and carriages, clothes and shoes, alongside mistresses, drinking and gambling as if they were all legitimate common expenses for a gentleman of means. Not at this time, thank you. Evan was aware that his tone was dry and the lawyer's brows came up. I've been to Whitehaven, my new estate, and the manor is in need of some improvements, which was stating things rather lightly. I am in town to find workers and to procure the supplies I will need to start the repairs. I will instruct the vendors to send all invoices here, but I will also require that copies be sent to Mr. Marcus Haverley, who will be acting as my proxy here in London while I return to Whitehaven to begin the work. Moody sat back in his chair and stroked his beard with one hand while drumming his fingers on his desktop with the other. You're going to be in the country, overseeing the work yourself. Wouldn't it be better to hire someone to do that? A gentleman would send an architect and a builder and would hire a decorator and a steward to accomplish his wishes while he stayed in the capital to enjoy the pleasures of the season. You can certainly afford it. No true gentleman would sully his hands with such trivial things as home maintenance. The frown on the older man's face irritated Evan, as did his reference to Evan not acting like a gentleman. He was tired of pretending to be something he was not, and yet there was no escape from the charades. He was an earl, and he would continue being an earl, whether he or the autant liked it or not. I prefer to have charge of the repairs myself. All I require is that you inspect the invoices and pay them in a timely manner. If you cannot do that, I am sure there are other law firms who would be eager for the opportunity. By the time Evan left Coles, Franks and Moody, the solicitor had practically been tripping over himself to accede to Evan's every wish. The bank was just as accommodating, though they did suggest a guard accompany Evan on his way back to Haverley House, considering the amount of money he'd withdrawn for immediate expenses and purchases. Evan declined, since he'd arranged to meet Marcus on the bank's steps at midday, and he would have the carriage. It was the first of many long days in London for Evan. All week as he went from lumberyard to bricklayer to ironmonger, Evan spent money he hadn't earned. He bought materials and tools, and along with Shant, gathered a workforce. With his own townhouse rented for the rest of the season, he continued to lodge with Marcus, heading back to Mayfair every evening with his mind and his list of things to do still full. He was eager to get back to Whitehaven and get work started. This assembling of an army, of having a battle plan, energised him in ways he hadn't felt since Spain. And if he was honest, he wanted to get back to Diana. He missed her, which surprised him.
She'd been part of his life for such a short time, and yet she'd begun to feel integral. Not only that, but it was his job to look after her, to protect her and see that she was provided for. He couldn't do that when they were apart. As he had so many times since returning to London, he unrolled the blueprints of Whitehaven, which Marcus had procured from the architectural firm that had built the house sixty years before. Thankfully, they were still in business, and had also done the renovations thirty years ago, when the previous earl had inherited. Evan ran his finger over the legend for the ground floor. Entry, parlour, dining, breakfast, library, music rooms. Then on the first floor, bedrooms, dressing rooms, ladies' sitting room, sewing room. And in one wing, rooms labelled the Royal Apartments. Rooms kept on the chance that a royal personage would grace the house with his or her presence. What a waste. The top floor and cellars were less ornate. With room for the nursery, schoolroom, servants' quarters, kitchens, storerooms, and more. In all, over fifty rooms made up the house. There was no way they could refurbish and repair fifty rooms before Easter. Impossible. They'd have to work on the various areas in some sort of order to prepare for the Prince Regent's visit. Evan's attention returned to the master suite. Two large sleeping quarters separated by adjoining his and her dressing rooms. An entire room, each to store clothing in and to dress. And separate bedrooms for the master and mistress. His parents had never had the luxury of separate bedrooms, living as they did in the manse of whatever parish in which his father served. But even if they had the option, Evan doubted they would have used it. Would Diana, raised to be a lady, prefer sleeping apart once they moved into the house? Would the servants expect it of the master and mistress? Living as a family, but with so many other people in the house, felt like an ordeal he might never get used to. His own mother had never employed so much as a charwoman before, and he was supposed to hire more than a dozen people just to work in his house, never mind all the employees who would toil on the estate. How thankful he was that he had Diana to help. When it came to estate management, he was as raw as a new recruit. God might have pitchforked him into this unfamiliar and daunting new arena of the gentry, but perhaps he'd also thrown Evan a lifeline in Diana for a help meet. On the evening of his last day in London, with a caravan of wagons loaded and ready for an early departure, and all the workers housed at an inn on the south side of the river, Evan held his hands to the fire at Haverley House, wondering what he'd forgotten. You've accomplished a mountain of work in a very short time. Marcus leaned back in his chair and propped his feet up on the desk. I wish you'd brought Diana with you, though. Word is out now that you're in town without her, and the biddies are clucking about it. I even had a rumour that you married Diana to get her money, took her off in the carriage, and when you were crossing the Thames, you pitched her in. He grinned. Now you're back to spend her money, and the Bow Street runner should be knocking on the door at any moment. Evan clenched his fists. That's excellent. I'm a usurper of a title I don't deserve, a fortune hunter, and now a murderer. It was said in jest, I'm sure. The fellow who voiced it was half in his cups at the club. Marcus stopped smiling. Speaking of which, I met your father-in-law coming out of Boodles this afternoon. I was walking by and he crashed into me. The man was completely foxed, and the doorman at the club was not best pleased when the Duke appeared ready to bring up his most recent meal onto the steps of the establishment. Seaton's been imbibing rather heavily since your wedding, it seems. He's in mourning for his lost fortune, I expect. I'm having a difficult time feeling sorry for him, considering everything. Evan took the poker and stirred the fire. The fact that he kept the inheritance a secret, considering what I know of the man, I shouldn't be surprised. But he forced Diana to keep it a secret too, to lie to me. No doubt she feared what he would do. He'd struck her in the face the night of the Olmax Barsh and I don't for a moment believe it was the first time. 
I won't soon forget he laid hands on Diana. He jabbed at the logs, reducing them to a pile of coals and ash. Oh, I'm not feeling sorry for him. Just wondering what will become of him if he continues down his current path. He's got a reputation for scheming, and things tend to work out the way he wants, because he doesn't give up. I believe you're probably the first man to ever thwart him and get away with it. But just because he hasn't taken action yet, doesn't mean he won't. He's got the cunning of a Spanish viper. Marcus laced his fingers across his waistcoat. You might want to be careful. He's a vengeful man, as well as a conniver. He won't take lightly your marrying his daughter, but even less the loss of all that money. He might be drunk as an old wheelbarrow at the moment, but you can wager he is hatching some plan to get his hands on at least part of that money. What can he do? His daughter is my bride. Evan shouldn't really be calling her his wife, not without them having consummated the marriage. He had thought he was protecting Diana by giving her time to get used to him, to get to know him, before sharing her bed. But perhaps it would be better to make her his wife now. Her father couldn't call for an annulment that way. And the money is residing in my bank account, where the Duke can't get at it. He can drink in rage and scheme all he wants, but what real harm can he do? If I were the Duke, I'd think about killing you, Marcus muttered. Evan turns. What? I'd kill you. Or have you killed? And soon. He stared at his hands. Follow my reasoning. His daughter is set to inherit a fortune when she marries. Under British law, the instant she is married, the money belongs to her husband. However, should the husband die before producing an heir, the money would then belong to his daughter and Seton would move all the bricks of St. Paul's Cathedral by hand if he had to in order to get her back under his control if she didn't have a husband to protect her. A shiver went through Evan, but he wasn't sure if it was internal or external. Kill him? For an inheritance? That's a bit extreme, isn't it? Murder? I'm sure he would make it appear to be an accident. Just be careful, won't you? Marcus tapped his laced fingers on the backs of his hands. There's Percival to consider, too. Word about town is that he's accrued quite a few gambling debts, pacifying his creditors with promises of money to come. Now his creditors have come calling. He's gone to ground somewhere, though I haven't been able to track him down just yet. Evan considered Marcus in the glow of the firelight. He looked the picture of relaxation, idle wealth and fine clothing, and yet he seemed to know much about the comings and goings of a lot of people. Was it just that London society was fairly small, a few hundred families at most, or was it something more? He seemed to be interested in knowing what many people were getting up to. Why care where Percival is gone? He's not out to kill me too, is he? Thoughts of such an ineffectual man as Percival Seaton didn't raise any fear in Evan. Not that I've heard, but as I said, I haven't been able to locate him this week. However, death threats aside, I would think you would care, having saved his life and all. And now he's your brother-in-law. Saving his life made you a hero, and then an earl in the first place. What prompted you to run out on the battlefield like that? The abrupt change in topic startled Evan. In an instant, the room seemed to close in around him as his mind rocketed from the chilly London study to the summer heat of Salamanca. What had prompted him to race into danger in Spain? Though he could hear the sounds of cannon and rifle, the screams of horses and men, though he could smell the smoke in blood and dirt, he couldn't bring the battle action into focus. He clenched the arms of the chair, his eyes narrowing. Pain radiated from the butt of his neck up across the top of his head. He took a deep breath in through his nose, out through his mouth, trying to stay calm. A flash of an image, then another. I was running down a slope. I needed a horse quickly because I had to get back behind the lines to our command post. 
The words came out as if he recited the story of another man. I had a message from my commanding officer. His voice trailed off as he stared into the fire, concentrating so hard, sweat popped out on his brow. What message? Though Marcus asked in a soft voice, there was something in his tone that said he was anything but asking casually. It was vital. Evan racked his memories, feeling as if he stood in a pool of light, in an otherwise darkened room, as images and bits and sounds and thoughts whirled around him. He closed his eyes, grabbing at the wispy tail of memory. I intercepted a spy. The door crashed open, and the Duchess of Haverley swept in. Marcus! Get your feet off that desk, and behave like the gentleman I raised you to be. The memory snapped from Evan's mental grasp and evaporated. Weakness radiated from his core, seeping through him like water across a stone floor. Slamming his eyes shut, he searched his head for the memory, but it was gone. He breathed hard as if he'd run a great distance. He wanted to shout at the Duchess for interrupting. He'd been on the cusp of remembering. But what? A spy? He'd intercepted a spy? He had been running down a hill, toward the battle. But from the French side? That couldn't be right. In the normal course of events, he would have had his rifle and been perched on some high ground, picking off the enemy's officers one by one. But there had been a message to deliver. Another oddity, because he was a lieutenant, and if he had worked for his commander, he would have sent an enlisted man instead of leaving his post to deliver it himself. He only would have relayed the message himself if it had been of the utmost urgency and secrecy. He opened his eyes. The Duchess shot him a hard look. He'd been so preoccupied with his memories, he'd forgotten to rise at her entrance. He pushed himself upright. Good evening, Your Grace. This was his first encounter with the Duchess since returning to London, and he was not sorry. Hmm. The butler tells me you'll be leaving tomorrow. She wore a green frock. Diamonds draped about her crept throat and ostrich feathers wafting about her iron-grey curls. It's all over town that you shunted your bride off to the country and left her there. Shameful, that's what it is. How you can expect to be accepted in London society when you behave like a... She waved her be-ringed hands, as if searching for the right descriptor, only to shrug, as if it exceeded her vocabulary to describe him. Man of no breeding is beyond me. You should be making your appearances at the opera, the theatre, dinner parties. And you should bring your bride and show everyone how happy you are. She sniffed and fingered the quizzing glass, hanging from a ribbon around her neck. Marcus, your sister will be arriving tomorrow, and I expect you to be here to greet her. She's created one excuse after another where she should stay in the country, but I've lost my patience. Sophie might be engaged and no longer needing the marriage mart, but she won't do herself any favours pining away in the country until her fiancé returns. Why you men get delusions of grandeur and head off to war is beyond me. Baron Richardson should be here, and we should be preparing for the wedding of the season. Marcus rolled his eyes. Sophie's never much cared for town, and Richard's doing his duty as a royal marine. You'd be better to blame old Boney for prolonging this war than the brave men who have been and are still fighting it. Marcus has turned a bit of a bite to it. Unusual when he spoke of or to his mother. She scowled. I might know you'd have taken the opposite side from my views. Marcus, why must you always vex me so? She sailed out of the room as abruptly as she'd arrived, closing the door with vigor. Evan massaged his temples. Maybe if he tried, he could remember. You said you encountered a spy? Marcus returned to the topic. How? What did you learn? He leaned forward, one fist on the desk. What could Evan say? 
that he didn't remember, that he couldn't recall much of anything from that day. That would lead to more questions he couldn't answer. He chose to treat the situation lightly, at least until more of his memory returns, if it ever did. And look what it got me. I ran onto the battlefield, wound up rescuing the Prince Regent's godson, and I have to dress up and play the fine gentleman for the rest of my life. I really can't talk about military secrets. I've told you too much already. He pressed his hands against his thighs and pushed himself upright, stretching and faking a yawn, praying Marcus wouldn't ask him anything more. I've got an early start in the morning, so I'd best head to bed. Thank you again for your hospitality and help. Marcus eyed him, creases forming between his brows. I'll continue on with the other things you've left for me to do, and I'll be down to Whitehaven soon. He rose, started to say something, and thought better of it. Then rubbed his palm against the back of his neck, beneath his longish hair. I know your estate seems a long way from London, but be careful all the same. Watch over Diana, and don't underestimate Seton. He won't accept this without a fight. And when he does fight, he won't play fair. Evan firmed his resolve. If it's a fight he wants, I'd say I have more experience. Perhaps he should be wary of me. Do you think it will be today? Diana gave a small sigh. The maid had asked the same question every day for the last week. Glancing at a homemade calendar on the desk, Diana didn't need to count to know Evan had been gone for eleven days. In some ways the time had gone quickly, and in others the days had stretched out to feel like a hundred. Eleven days at this inn, lavishing attention on Kean. Cuddling, singing, rocking, admiring his sweet smiles that came with more frequency. Eleven days without fear of an angry outburst from her father, a sly digger slap from her brother, but also eleven days of worrying and wondering if the Duke would send someone for the baby and she would be powerless to stop him. Eleven days and nights of wondering about her new husband, about where he was, what he was doing. Eleven days of remembering that almost kiss and being filled with an odd longing and regret that it hadn't happened. Wondering if they could be happy together and wondering when he would choose to exercise his marital rights. Evan had been in a rush to make her his bride, but not to make her his wife. How was she supposed to fulfill her duty of providing him with an heir if they never shared a marriage bed? Certainly the flight from London and his quick return to the city had interrupted things. But beyond that near kiss, he'd made no advances of a romantic nature, which did little for a girl's confidence. Perhaps when he returned, they would sort things out. I hope he gets here soon. Time is getting away from us. She'd circled the 18th of April as the date by which she hoped they would have the major repairs finished. The 18th was Easter Sunday, which the prince would surely observe in London. He was the current titular head of the Church of England, after all. Following Easter, he would venture to Brighton and could arrive here as soon as the 19th, though she hoped he would wait until the beginning of May before heading south. If only the prince had specified a day and a duration for his stay, she could arrange things better. She didn't care if plans changed, but she needed to know there was one in the first place. Strategizing gave her a sense of security and control, something she'd had precious little of in her life. Diana rose from the desk and gathered her papers, butting them into a neat pile and slipping them into the leather folder that had become her constant companion. Pencils went into loops inside, and she gathered her reticule. I'm going to the manor. I'm not sure what time I will return, but it will be before dark. Beth nodded. A snuffling cry came from the adjoining room. He'll be wanting a feed and a cuddle, I expect. She hopped up from her chair, her cup slipping on her head. Torn between wanting to stay with Kean and needing to get on with her work, Diana wrapped her cloak around herself and donned her riding gloves. 
I must fly. I've finished the ground floor, and today I'll be working upstairs. The local vicar had generously made his horse and gig available for her use. And when she reached the tap room, the innkeeper sent one of the hostlers out to hitch up for her. Good morning, my lady. He'd certainly been helpful and deferent.